The first time I saw the 3 a.m. bus, I was walking home from a tavern with my roommate. It was raining and we were drunk, stumbling along in our boots and not really caring if we got soaked. I usually wouldn't have noticed a random bus driving down the street, especially in the state I was in. But I had just finished complaining about how we had to walk in the rain, and why wasn't there a late night bus route that could take us home quickly. We were both far too cheap to pay for a cab or an Uber, plus we'd spent all our money on alcohol. Why is that guy waiting at the bus stop? Didn't you just uh, say that uh, all the buses were done for the night? Uh. You're going to die from those hiccups just like that guy in the Guinness Book of Records. That ain't going away. Nice knowing you, bud. Seriously, why is he just standing there? We should tell him. I started stumbling over in that direction and Tom pulled me back suddenly out of the street. Just as I was about to cross, a bus appeared out of nowhere. The hell? Where did that come from? I asked. If he hadn't grabbed me, the bus would have easily killed me. It looked like an ordinary city bus, except the ads on the side didn't make any sense. Drink Gluberton Foam, it read. There was a super realistic, computer-generated, I presumed, creature displayed on the side of the bus. It had a foamy green milk mustache and held aloft a bottle of the aforementioned Gluberton foam. The creature was purple and covered in spines like a sea urchin. It had one large eye instead of two that dangled from an eye socket in the center of its face. Tom didn't see the ad, he said later on. He was too distracted by the fact that I had almost killed myself. Yo, what the hell were you thinking, man? He asked me after the bus drove away. Shut up about the damn bus. You could have died. We left there and I looked back to see the man who'd been waiting at the bus stop was now gone. An overwhelming curiosity began to grow inside of me. I wanted to know where the strange bus had come from. Where it had gone. It had seemed to appear and then vanished without a trace. I marked the details of what had happened down in a new journal I had gotten for my birthday. This would end up becoming THE journal that I would use to track my progress at locating the 3am bus. It wasn't easy, it took years actually. For every hundred times I went out looking for the damn thing, I saw it maybe once or twice. The bus was elusive, and it gave a clue if you look closely. Something that I should have realized immediately, but took me a while longer than it should have. I realized I wasn't supposed to look for the bus. I was supposed to look for the riders. The strange folks who actually traveled on this bus, operating outside the normal hours. So I drove the streets looking for them, and when I saw them, very rarely, I watched them. I observed them from a distance at first, too afraid to approach, but eventually I built up my courage. It was the fourth time I'd seen one particular rider. I referred to him in my journals as the trench coat man because he wore a charcoal trench coat and a wide-brimmed hat. His face was always shrouded in shadows, and he was constantly smoking a cigarette. In his other hand was a briefcase. These things never changed about him. When I saw him that time, I finally did it. I overcame my fears and got out of my car and approached him in the rain. Oh, that was the other thing. It was always raining when I saw this particular character. But he was by far the most frequently seen. My feet splashed through the cold puddle, soaking my shoes, but I didn't care. I was finally on the right side of the road with the trench coat man just a few yards away. I was panting. 
out of breath when I finally got to him. The bus came a second later, and the doors opened up in front of us. Cutting it pretty close, aren't you? He asked me, his face still cloaked in shadow. Uh, Yeah, sorry about that, I said. In my mind, I never had seen myself getting this far. The 3 a.m. bus had always been an elusive ghost. And now I was about to step onto it. Did I want to? I realized I hadn't thought this through. An overwhelming curiosity propelled me forward, and I realized I would die if I had to. But I had to see this through. I needed to find out what the strange bus was, and where it came from. The man sighed resignedly and walked up the steel staircase onto the bus. I followed after him. As soon as the doors closed behind me, I realized I had made a terrible mistake. But by then, it was too late. All the windows were blacked out, and I suddenly felt like a prisoner being marched into a cell. What had I been thinking getting on the strange bus? Nothing was right about any of the passengers, I realized, my heart beating fast in my throat. I shook uncontrollably with fear, but somehow realized I had no choice but to keep moving forward. There was no getting off now. The driver motioned me past him, grunting impatiently as he began to drive, pointing his black-nailed thumb back towards the rear of the bus. The driver had a large, bulbous, purple head, and a lumpy body covered in zit-like postules. He was clothed in a black bus driver's uniform and hat, As he opened his mouth to yell at me, I saw rows and rows of sharp teeth inside, and a long, pointed black tongue. Come, come, you're going to upset him, the man in the trench coat said, motioning me to sit down next to him at the rear of the bus. I began to walk down the aisle of the bus on shaky legs, trying not to stare rudely at all manner of alien and bizarre creatures which sat on either side of me on the cramped bus. Near the front, a squid man sat, holding a small, pale creature with wide black eyes in its lap like a pet. There was a tall thing to the right, which looked elastic and wrong, its features deep-set into folds that seemed to render it senseless and blank. And yet it observed me with interest as I passed by, seeming keenly aware that I did not belong here. A huge beast which looked to have been sewn together from many different creatures and people sat taking up two seats, holding a giant cleaver in its massive hands. It smelled like the butcher shop and like blood and meat. There were lizard men and frog people, things that looked like ants, and men with bull's head and bear's chests. A talking man was having a lively conversation with another bored-looking half-bird humanoid passenger who sat next to it. An amorphous blob sat behind the trench coat man at the very back of the bus, taking up the whole wide bench there. I sat down and my guide lit a fresh cigarette, exhaling faintly purple smoke. He had a clipboard in his shadowy hands and seemed to be examining me with interest. I have to say, I'm kind of surprised you showed up. The last three didn't. Obviously, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I played along. Or at least tried to. I was hoping I could still get some answers, even if I was terrified. And wanted to eventually get home at the end of all this. Uh, well, I I guess I'm not like the other three, I said vaguely. You certainly aren't. They were much skinnier. You seem like you could actually be of some use to us. Are there more like you on GXR-187? Uh, 
GXR-187? I'm sorry, what you refer to as... Earth. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. I mean, we all like to think we're one of a kind and all that, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a couple million people who are probably just like me. That seemed to pique his interest. Really? Well, we're always looking for new recruits. I suppose our methods need to be adjusted. The Craigslist ads have been yielding dwindling results. Ah, I thought to myself. So this is a job interview. They've been trying to recruit people from Earth to join some sort of project. How exciting. I wondered if this could be a breakthrough for all of mankind. I mean, contact with intelligent life from other... Planets? Dimensions? Mm. Craigslist. Yeah, nobody uses that anymore. I can show you some better websites. Indeed is pretty good. I, I, well, I guess Monster.com would be a little on the nose. I don't understand. Never mind. The bus came to a stop suddenly, and the passengers started getting off. Well, here we are. Would you like a quick tour before getting down to business? Sure, I said, excited to see what this operation entailed. We got off the bus, amidst the crush of alien creatures all around us. Slimy bodies and hairy ones pressed against mine, as I tried not to lose the trench coat man amidst the crowd. I followed after him closely, until we were out of the bus terminal. I looked up in awe and wonder at the sky above, once we were out in the open air. Part of me wondered what I was breathing and if it was close enough to air that I wouldn't die. Because we were clearly not in Kansas anymore. Not that I live in Kansas, but you get the picture. Whirling galaxies and multiple suns shine down on us from above. The sky a pale, greenish-blue shade. The clouds were pink like cotton candy. And creatures like dinosaurs flew through the sky above as well as futuristic-looking spacecraft. Large ships, like intergalactic freighters, took off from the roof of a massive building that the crowd was lined up and walking towards. I had never seen a structure so enormous. It disappeared into the distance from both sides that were visible, no end in sight. The haze obscured the far ends of it, which appeared to be many kilometers in the distance. The undertaking involved in creating such an enormous factory was mind-boggling. I surmised quickly that it was a manufacturing facility for Gluberton Foam, the product I had seen advertised on the side of the 3AM bus, since large banners and displays were everywhere for the stuff. When we got closer to the building, I saw clearly a large sign with huge letters proclaiming this to be the headquarters and central manufacturing facility for the company. I tried not to think too hard about the fact I could read all the signs, and they weren't written in some alien language. The possibility that this was all a sleep-deprived hallucination occurred to me briefly, but then I shrugged it off. This was way too real. Trenchcoat Man led me onto a moving platform, that brought us in through a visitor's entrance. The platform lifted up off the ground and began to levitate, bringing us around to various stations and showing us Gluberton foam being made step by step. Here's where volunteers such as yourself are brought into the facility for processing. We use a state-of-the-art stunning procedure that is virtually painless. I saw through a window the other passengers from the bus being led in through a doorway, like cattle, into a meat plant. An electric shock hit them like lightning from both sides of their heads, and they fell down onto the floor unconscious. The talking cat from the bus seemed to have gotten away somehow, but the other passengers I saw fell one by one to the floor, unmoving. Moving on, we'll proceed to the... 
The platform lifted off again and began to move on to the next station. I was suddenly even more terrified than before. Stunned, senseless, and unable to hear the words coming from my guide. This wasn't a job interview. I had just signed up to be... slaughtered. So you're saying you don't want to be killed and processed into an easily digestible foam? If it was possible for a man without a face to give an incredulous look, the shadowy trench coat man was giving me one. He stood there waiting for a response from me while we moved on from station to station on a levitating platform, which took us touring around the Gluberton Foam Central Manufacturing Facility. The place was massive inside, bigger than any city back on Earth. I decided it was time to be upfront and honest. Since bluffing and lying had almost gotten me killed on this accidental interdimensional adventure. Uh, no, please don't. Please don't kill and eat me. I... Uh, look, I just got on the bus because it looked really weird, and buses aren't supposed to come at that time of night, and... And man, I was just curious, so shit, I'm gonna fucking die here, aren't I? The words were pouring out of me faster than I could think. And all I knew was that this guy wasn't going to help me. I was going to be turned into foodstuffs. Becoming part of the indiscriminate green ooze that was sold across the multiverse as Gluberton Foam. Okay, calm down. If you don't want to be part of the Alliance, just say so. The trench coat man said, sounding judgmental. Whew, so I don't have to be turned into foam? I can just go back home? Of course. We're not savages. Oh, man. That's a relief. Uh, What did you say about an alliance? I asked, curious again, now that I knew I wasn't going to be killed. Well, I don't usually explain these things to outsiders. Eh, But it doesn't really matter now, anyways. The platform took off again and moved to a station with a window overlooking the production floor. Shiny, high-tech machinery could be seen filling up every conceivable shape and size of vessel with green foam. There were things like toothpaste tubes, tubs the size of mayonnaise jars, barrels and basins and buckets, ranging all the way to huge vats the size of water towers, and even larger. From this central processing location, we feed the entire GXR sector of the multiverse. All participating member planets receive enough supply for their dominant species to survive and thrive. Once the carrying capacity of the member planet is reached, we begin to call the excess for production. It's a win-win for all involved. Assuming your species is compatible with the fumification process took me a minute to understand what he was saying. So, what you're telling me is every planet eats nothing but Gluberton foam. They don't have to worry about food anymore? Uh, Or liquid. Water, in your planet's case. The foam is also hydrating, and can be formulated to any specifications for maximum usefulness. Every mineral, vitamin, Amino acid and supplement needed to prevent disease and extend life is researched and supplied. The benefits of Alliance membership are far-reaching beyond that, of course. Food supply is just the very beginning. Wow, so you supply all that and in return we just give you people that you can kill and turn into more Gluberton foam? Essentially, yes. By offering yourself for processing, you would have made the first step towards joining the Alliance. A sacrifice to show your planet's willingness to give and receive in order to be a part of this great fellowship. But now, sadly, well, four strikes and you're out. That's what we say anyways. So that was the last chance for Earth. Wait, so people were volunteering to get eaten? Uh, Yeah. Like I said, Craigslist. 
but mostly they just said they wanted to be eaten and then they never showed up. Highly irregular and quite rude, if you ask me. Mm, yeah, sounds like Craigslist. The platform lifted off again and moved on to another station where we could watch the Globerton foam being put onto pallets and stacked and moved by hovering forklifts. Okay, well, I think I can safely say that Earth is not interested in this proposition. We don't eat each other where I come from. He made a slightly annoyed sound. Oh, so you got it all figured out, eh? Good for you. Not like I've seen worlds like yours before. You're all going to be dead inside of... Uh, you know what, forget it, I'm not going to waste my time. I could tell he was getting annoyed with me. Better try to mend fences, I thought to myself. Or you're going to really piss him off and wind up stuck here. He's your only way back, after all. I had no idea how to navigate my way out of this enormous factory. Look, I'm sorry, that probably sounded judgmental. We're just... Look, we're not ready for this as a species, I don't think. But hey, give us another 50 years and we'll be begging to be turned into foam. He turned around and uncrossed his arms. Really? You mean that? Yeah, probably. I was doing math in my head, trying to figure out if I would be dead by then. Mm, 85, so probably dead. Definitely. 50 years, or maybe a little more like 60, and, and we're going to be there. So, what do you say? Will you help me get home? I would really, really, really appreciate it. It smells like blood in here. Like, so, so much blood. It was true. The coppery smell was intensifying as we got further into the factory. We were now at a window, looking out onto the killing floor. Okay, this is the last stop, then I'll show you back to the bus. But we can't make this thing move any faster, so we're gonna be stuck here for a minute. Might as well watch the show. Oh look, they're butchering a Farfig Newtian. This is gonna be interesting. I tasted acid and bile rising into my throat unpleasantly as I watched, too horrified and stunned to turn away. They were slicing the giant green alien's pale belly open with a sharp knife. One of the workers held the wound edge open, so another could climb inside and start to pull out the entrails from the massive beast. It was the size of an elephant compared to them. Oh no, clearly another batch who didn't pay attention in safety training, the man in the trench coat said, shifting nervously. The worker who had climbed into the giant alien's belly was suddenly screaming and the others ran to assist him. Tentacles were wrapping him up and sucking him deeper into the belly of the giant dead creature, swallowing him like quicksand as he flailed and screamed. Hang on a second, I'll be right back, the trench coat man said. He pushed a button and the glass panel turned to liquid, and he stepped right through it, surprising me by leaving me alone on the floating platform. He walked over to the crew and began shouting at them, telling them to stop what they were doing. Blood began to spray out from the center of the huge beast, and teeth could be seen devouring the worker who had been ensnared. I was watching him nervously, waiting for him to come back, when suddenly the platform began to move again. It was on a timer, it seemed, and was programmed to move on to the next station, on the factory tour. Hey, hey, trench go guy! I yelled, but it was too late. I was left alone on the platform as it moved on to the final stop of the tour. It had taken us full circle, back to the lineup which led to the killing floor. I tried to sidestep around the crush of alien creatures who surrounded me on all sides, but found myself swept away toward the killing floor. Soon I was stuck in the quick-moving line, which led to the stun gun apparatus I had seen earlier. Screaming, I tried desperately to get out of the line I had been forced into, but my cries for help were muffled by the huge, furry forms of two tall, bigfoot-like creatures who stood on either side of me. They were waiting placidly for their time to come, seeming unbothered by their impending death. Help! Help! I'm not supposed to be here! I was supposed to go back home! I shouted at them. Mm, too bad for you. I tried to tell them the same thing, said the one just in front of me. Then he was knocked senseless by a bolt of electricity on either side of his neck. 
I ducked just in time, looking up to see the electric shock device was automatically adjusted to each individual's height. I had barely managed to avoid it and half expected alarm bells to start ringing, and for alien workers to come running, but nothing happened. The conveyor belt I stood on kept moving forward, and I watched horrified as each alien creature in front of me was sliced up at lightning speed by an assortment of robot arm-controlled blades, which swung down from the ceiling. It was like a meat factory from hell, a manufacturing facility made for suffering, seeing all of the gleaming robots working so rapidly at their tasks of disemboweling and disassembling the bloody bodies. As I approached the section, I became more and more terrified, as the conveyor belt I was stuck on was now hovering over an expanse of nothingness below, a sheer drop on both sides of more than a hundred yards, and below that, steel mesh grates caught the bloody viscera and guts being flung from the blades above. They were probably going to make hot dogs with what remained on them. The huge Sasquatch creature lying prone in front of me was suddenly picked up by huge steel grabber hands, and he was horrifically skinned and flayed, his arms and legs separated from his torso. Quickly, the blades began to slice and took the meat from the bone with ease. Just as the blades were coming at me, something caught my eye. There was a cat sitting atop a piece of machinery near the conveyor belt. He had his legs crossed and looked quite comfortable and unconcerned with the dire situation I was in, screaming and terrified. Then he surprised me by speaking, and I realized it was the same talking cat I'd seen on the bus which brought us here. If you want to live, you'd better jump down that chute. Those blades are coming for you, and they won't miss you like that stun gun machine did. Without thinking about it too much or questioning it, I jumped feet first down a manhole-sized opening filled with blood and guts. I went sliding down into darkness, going faster and faster until I finally landed in a disgusting slurry of blood and internal organs. It was all the cast-off waste from the incoming livestock. It smelled putrid, coppery, and disgusting. It was thick, slimy, and coated me head to toe as I screamed for help from the cesspool of viscera. No one answered my calls for help, and I found myself drowning, gulping mouthfuls of blood instead of air, as I tried to stay afloat. Then a blaring siren pierced my ears and began to echo throughout the space. I heard the sound of a drain opening up beneath me and gasped for a breath of air before being sucked down into the whirlpool, which took me under. I could see nothing and only felt fear for my life as I held my breath and torpedoed through the drain pipe filled with blood and innards. They went up my nose and into my mouth. All I could think of was my family friends, and how I would never see them again. I was going to drown in a sewer of blood. But then suddenly I saw light. The greenish-blue sky above with its swirling galaxies and multiple suns greeted me as I was spit out a drain pipe and into a murky lake made of blood. Swimming and clawing my way out of there onto the shoreline, I raced up the steep slope towards the factory entrance, hoping the bus was still there. The 3 a.m. bus which had taken me to this horrible place. That was when I saw the trench coat man wandering around smoking a cigarette and pacing outside the gates. The bus was in the distance a little ways behind him. Running over to him, I felt a smile spread across my face. He had agreed to get me home. I was finally going to get out of this mess. Whew, I'm so glad I found you, I said, coughing up blood when I was close enough to talk to him. Hello. Can I go home now, please? He blew out a cloud ring of pink smoke and chuckled. The sound was like broken glass and nails on a chalkboard. I suddenly realized this was not the same trench coat man. This one was taller and broader and seemed more malevolent somehow. I backed away slowly from him. What? Don't you want to be part of the product? Oh, 
we could probably make a whole bat out of you, Chunky. He was coming at me, and I realized not every employee from this company was as friendly as the talent scout I'd met. I ducked under his shadowy grasp and ran past him as quickly as I could towards a 3 a.m. bus. The doors were closing just as I arrived, and I stuck my hand in the gap to stop it. The pinch was painful, but not as painful as being turned into foam, so I didn't mind. I heaved the doors open with all my strength and ran up the stairs and past the purple, pustule-covered driver. Earth, please, I asked the driver politely. Huh? Oh, no. I struggled to recall the alphanumeric code for Earth that the trench coat man had said. Uh, GXR 187? I said, unsure. He seemed to understand and then motioned me to the back of the bus. I was the only one aboard, I realized. There didn't seem to be an issue with my request since we began moving immediately. Within minutes, we were back at the bus stop where I'd gotten on. It was the same rainy night, and nothing much had changed. My car was still sitting a little ways back and was parked at the side of the road where I had left it. I got up and went towards the front of the bus to exit. The driver opened the door and looked at me darkly as I walked past. Proceeding down the steps, I heard his voice behind me, and as I stepped out into the rain, the words hit me, and I would remember them for the rest of my life. You doomed your planet to oblivion, son. Good job. Hope saving your own skin was worth it. The door swung shut behind me, and the bus drove off into the rainy night, into the darkness. Water from the sky washed away the sticky blood and guts which covered me, and made a cloudy pool of crimson rainwater beneath my feet. The bus was gone vanished as if it had never existed. I looked for it after that many times. It never came back. He never came back. And now when I watch the news and see stories of famine and plagues, global warming and water shortages, I can't help but think, can't help but wonder, I might have made a terrible mistake. I woke up to the sounds of cans being shuffled and tossed outside my bedroom window. It was loud and irritating, and I covered my head with the pillow to shut out the noise. It didn't help. Is he back again? My wife asked from beside me. What time is it? I looked at the numbers on my phone, sitting on the table beside the bed. Not even six o'clock. Can you please get rid of him? As much as I didn't want to get out of the warm bed to venture out into the chilly morning air, I wouldn't be able to sleep if he stayed out there. And if memory was serving me correctly, He was going to be out there for quite a while. Mr. Scraps was a connoisseur of cans, and he was very discriminating. With an annoyed grunt and a few words muttered beneath my breath, I got out of bed and put on my slippers. Mr. Scraps. The scourge of our pleasant little middle-income neighborhood. No one knew where the man had come from. He seemed to just appear one day. At first I thought he would be there for a few days and the cops would make him move it along to the next little town or to another neighborhood, but instead he stuck around. Once or twice I saw the cops questioning him, but they'd always get back into their car afterwards and drive off. When people spoke to him, they weren't quite the same afterwards either. At least, it seemed that way to me. The cops in our town were acting funny now since they'd encountered Mr. Scraps one by one. Each time, they'd approached him with a determined look in their eye, according to reports, and then they'd wander off slightly confused and disoriented. 
When they drove away in their cars, the police officers seemed to have forgotten how to drive. Although they usually picked it up again, quickly enough, after a few minutes. I served on city council, and word was starting to spread about these little incidents. It was hard to explain, but Mr. Scraps had an effect on people. At least that was the rumor. I told myself it was silly, though. Like people who claimed to have been hypnotized on stage by performers. Those things weren't really possible. You couldn't fundamentally change based on one encounter with a stranger. When I was half asleep in my bed, I had partially forgotten about all of these encounters. But now that I was on my way to talk to Mr. Scraps for myself, I had to admit I was getting a bit nervous. I remembered my neighbor, Mrs. Donnelly, and how she had gone out to scold him for rummaging through her cans. I'd been watching from my front window after hearing the loud noises he'd been making. Through the window pane, their conversation was muted, but I could still observe with a quiet raptness the strange sight that was happening across the street. Mrs. Donnelly in her housecoat, tromping down the driveway and looking angry, her pink fuzzy slippers and robe in stark contrast to the furious expression on her face, When she got to the end of the driveway, though, her face changed. Mr. Scraps said barely a word to her, and yet she turned around and started stumbling back up towards her house as if drunk. Meanwhile, the man continued rummaging through her cans, as if the interaction had barely distracted him for a second. I saw her the next day and spoke to her, and she barely said a word back to me. Her usually well-kept hair was disheveled, and for once I saw she was wearing no makeup at all. Typically, the woman was a picture of elegance and style. I hardly ever saw her out of the house without a new article of clothing or jewelry, carrying her little designer dog in one hand. But that morning, she was in the same pink housecoat and fuzzy slippers as the day before. Her clothes were dirty, as if she'd been outside all night in the forest, or rolling around on the grass. She'd been smiling, too, looking very happy, whereas usually she was a bit sour and complained a lot. We don't talk much, so I just said good morning to her and asked if she was alright. I had been out fetching the paper from the end of the driveway, but she looked like she was just wandering her property aimlessly. She mumbled something back and stumbled away, seemingly with no intention of going back inside. Mrs. Donnelly, are you alright? I called after her again, but received no response. The more I thought about these strange events, the more nervous I became going outside to confront Mr. Scraps. It seemed like I should be more scared, as if the whole town should be more scared of this man who had arrived out of nowhere, but instead we were treating him just like another vagrant. I paused at the front door, wondering to myself if I should really go outside. What would happen to me if I did? Was he really just some poor man without a home, looking through bins for empty bottles? Or was Mr. Scrap something much worse, something much darker and more mysterious? I shook off that idea's lunacy. Things like that didn't really exist outside of horror movies and podcasts. This was real life. Mr. Scraps wasn't some sorcerer. He was just a man without a home looking to make some measly income somehow. Turning the doorknob, I stepped outside into the chilly early morning air. The grass was covered in dew and the sky was still dark. I could still hear the sounds of Mr. Scraps going through the bins, tossing cans and bottles into his shopping cart, which he pushed all around town. He was really making a ruckus out there. It was almost like he wanted me to catch him. I walked over to him, feeling like my footsteps were very loud in the early morning air. So quiet that you could hear a train in the distance rattling along the tracks several miles away. The birds weren't out yet, and even the crickets seemed to have fallen silent, as if in anticipation. Suddenly I was too terrified to speak to the man. Looking at him standing there, I began to wonder if he really was a man at all or something else much different, much darker, something more powerful than a person. He began to turn around very slowly, and it was too much for me to bear. 
I ran back inside, trying to ignore the sounds of him snickering behind me. Did you tell him to go away? My wife asked as I came back into the bedroom. Because he's still out there. Louder than ever. I'll call the cops, I said. He could be dangerous. You don't want to sneak up on somebody like that. You've heard the stories. My wife shot out of bed, looking angry. Those cops don't do anything. He's been here for weeks, and he's not going away. I'm sick of it. Those stories are a bunch of bullshit anyways. She stomped past me, and I tried to stop her, but she wouldn't listen. I yelled at her not to go out there, but she told me I was being ridiculous. I followed her to the front door and then stopped. Despite my fear for her, my own terror was now overriding that. I was beginning to feel more and more like this whole town had been lulled to sleep by this man. As if we were the proverbial toad in a pot of water being gradually brought up to a boil. Our lives in terrible danger as we closed our eyes and told ourselves this man was just a regular person down on his luck. Christine, wait! I tried one more time, but she shot me the middle finger over her shoulder and continued stomping over towards the man who was now waking up the whole neighborhood with his noisy behavior. Lights were coming on in various houses, as people looked outside to see what the commotion was all about. Again, I had that same thought. It's like he's doing it on purpose. Christine said something to the man, and he turned around to look at her, glancing over her shoulder at me momentarily as he did so. I saw his lips were moving, but his eyes were watching me. My wife turned around almost as soon as she'd arrived there, and after spinning on her heel, she walked past me and went right inside the house. What did he say, Christine? I asked as she went by. But she just ignored me. My wife, of the past ten years, went by without saying a word and walked into the house immediately into the basement. I followed after her, hearing the sounds of tossed cans receding further and further into the distance as I went down the stairs into the darkness. Christine didn't even bother turning on a light. It was like she was on a mission. She went over to a pile of boxes and began lifting them up to get something at the bottom of the stack. She went over to a pile of boxes and began lifting them up to get something at the bottom of the stack. What are you doing? I asked, feeling scared, watching my wife acting like a zombie. I went around in front of her and tried to pull her away from the boxes, but she was relentless. Couldn't be dissuaded. Finally, she found out what she was looking for and pulled it out. It was unmarked, and there was no indication of what it could be. But she seemed to know exactly what it was. As she removed the contents of the box and began to interact with what was inside, I started to back away, terrified. What the hell was happening to her? Why was she acting like this? I ran upstairs and went outside to scream at Mr. Scraps to ask him what he'd done to her. But he was gone. The next morning, Christine was still playing with the things from inside the box. I had stayed up all night watching her, trying to talk to her, but she didn't engage. She just kept playing with her old childhood doll, the one she had stowed away in a box all those years ago. I remembered her telling me once it had been her favorite. And the way she played with it, you could see the childlike wonder she had once possessed. She acted as if the toy were real, talking to it, interacting with it as if it were her best friend. And she ignored me completely. I managed to get her outside to the car and take her to the hospital. Whatever Mr. Scraps had said to her had apparently caused some sort of mental break. I just hoped it was repairable. At first, my wife didn't want to get back in the car... But eventually I tried the tactic of telling her we were going out for ice cream, and she giggled and got into the back seat, not even trying to sit up front. She sat in the back and played with her doll as I drove us towards the hospital. I watched her nervously in the mirror, thinking how creepy it was to see a grown woman acting like a little kid again. There was nothing cute or endearing about it, and I was getting more and more worried about whether we'd be able to get her back to normal. I slammed hard on the brakes of the green light as two cop cars raced through a red, going perpendicular through the intersection just as we were about to pass through. The cop car up front had its siren and flashing lights off, 
But there was a police officer driving and looking out the window, laughing and looking back at the other cop behind him. The cop behind him was leaning out of the window and firing his service revolver, trying to hit the other police car's tires. The sound of gunfire echoed through the neighborhood and a stray bullet ricocheted and shattered a window. The whole time, the cop firing his gun was laughing and yelling about something about cops and robbers. Too stunned and horrified to know what to do about this, I kept driving. But the sights along the way to the hospital got stranger and stranger along the way. Mr. Scraps had been very busy. A full-grown man was seen on his hands and knees in his driveway, burning ants with a magnifying glass. An elderly woman was on the roof of her two-story house, dancing and singing along to a record player she'd hooked up up there. Two people who looked like they were in their 80s were drawing with sidewalk chalk on Main Street, blocking two lanes of traffic, and I had to honk to get them out of the way. People were walking out of a department store carrying bicycles, which they got onto and rode away one after another. I counted at least 20 of them and saw a man inside was handing them out to anyone who asked. Another employee could be seen behind him, setting stuffed animals on fire, and dancing around a bonfire he'd made with their furry, blazing bodies. I could see more chaos happening through the large front windows of the store, and had to tear my eyes away to look back at my driving. A moment later, I had to swear to avoid a man in a plumber's uniform riding a skateboard. We were almost at the hospital, and I was becoming more and more afraid of what we might find there. I pulled up to the front door, not caring about getting a ticket as I left the car behind. I was feeling fairly certain that a parking ticket was the least of my worries now. Once we got inside the ER, I began to smell the dead bodies. It stinks in here, my wife said, covering her nose with one hand, holding onto her doll with the other. Can we go home? Not yet, I said, hating the way she was talking. I wanted to scream at her to speak like a normal adult, but I knew that wouldn't help anything. This wasn't her fault, it was Mr. Scraps. He had done something to her. Not just her, he had done something to the whole fucking town. The emergency department was empty, aside from the corpses. There were at least three dead bodies I could see right away. They were strapped to gurneys, and one had coagulated blood dripping from the stretcher down to the floor below. A man, who appeared to have been in a car accident, was white from blood loss his face frozen in a scream. There was an elderly woman with a grin stuck on her face, similarly dead. I couldn't bear to look at that last one, and pulled my wife past, heading for the desk. There was no triage nurse or anyone to greet us. The small emergency department was devoid of any staff members, no doctors or nurses, orderlies or cleaners. I walked past the section with my wife, pulling her along like a child during a temper tantrum. She kept saying she wanted to go home, and I couldn't blame her. Eventually I found a doctor. At least I presumed she was a doctor. The 50-ish year old woman was wearing a white coat and had a stethoscope in her hands, but she was on the floor holding the listening end of the instrument up to the chest of a small stuffed bear. You're very sick, Mr. Teddy, she said, pulling him in for a hug. And I'm going to make you all better. My wife got down on the floor of the waiting room and sat down next to her. The two of them built up a silent rapport, like kids usually do. They began to play together, and my wife held up her doll for the woman to use her instrument to check her out next. Can I try next? She asked politely. The doctor woman nodded enthusiastically, and they started introducing themselves to each other. I left them there for a few minutes to continue searching for a grown-up. Someone who had not yet made the mistake of speaking to Mr. Scraps. As I turned a corner, there he was. It was as if he knew I was coming. He was looking through a bin of cans beside a door that said Staff Break Room, but he looked up when he saw me. The two of us locked eyes for a second, then I ducked back behind the wall. I heard him rummaging through the cans again a moment later. I've been stuck here ever since. I haven't moved. I don't know why, but I feel like I need to speak with him. Something is pulling me around that corner to talk to him just like all the others. The sound of cans being shuffled is almost hypnotizing, and is almost making me forget why I was here in the first place. 
Maybe it's because I looked into his eyes. Twice now. Maybe that's all it takes for him to get his hooks in you. Maybe he really is a sorcerer. Something more than human. There's no way to stop it. I could barely get through typing this out, but I need there to be a record. I need proof. I'm terrified of what's going to happen to me, but I need to ask him. I need to ask him what he did to my wife. And if there's any way to reverse it. If something happens to me and you don't hear from me again, please listen to my advice. Don't speak to Mr. Scraps. If he shows up in your town, let him make all the noise he wants. Let him take your cans and bottles. And be grateful that he doesn't take anything else. One morning after mowing the lawn, I found a strange crimson velvet envelope between the cracks in the ground. Surrounded by an eerie pink-reddish glow, it was mesmerizing to look at. I felt drawn to it, almost like it was placed there on purpose for me to find. I always was a firm believer in the supernatural, but I never got a chance to experience it. I thought this might be a unique opportunity to see, once and for all, if there's something more to it. I thought I could finally get the answers I've been searching for my whole life. I always thought about it, and my mind was provoked by this question, by this never-ending string of dark and twisted enigmas that have always filled my soul. What were heaven and hell like? Was there a purgatory also? What if all we ever knew was fake, and not according to the reality that was beyond the veil of human perception? The more I looked at the strange envelope, the more it began to take hold of my spirit. This energy that started flowing through my body was something evil, I think. That's how it felt at first. A strange sensation of the purest evil, indescribable in human words, was dropping needles in my soul, like I wanted to perform a voodoo ritual on it. My mind, body, and spirit all became weakened by this amazing and crushing force that was coming from that envelope. So I gave in to it. I let it take over. I didn't even try to fight it. My desire to see and feel the supernatural transcended my will to live. It was at this moment I knew I could find something bigger than me. Bigger than humanity itself. The envelope was sealed in blood. It was signed to you by an old demon. I started feeling scared, fear clouding my mind, its poisonous arms reaching within the very dark and cold abyss of my consciousness. Right under the seal it said, pour your own blood over the seal to open this letter, written in minuscule letters. This raw, powerful energy was taking over me and replacing whoever I was with something anew, with something powerful and evil at the same time. But there was something else I was feeling then, some sort of guilt, sadness of not belonging. But they were not mine. The letter was emanating them, I could feel that. I bit my finger and let drops of blood fall on the seal, I felt displaced, lost in time and space forever. The letter was short, and I'll write it here verbatim, because it felt very, very frightening to read it. I don't know how, but I remember it word by word. Dear human, I didn't want you to ever find this letter, let alone read it. But yet, here we are. I'm sick of it all. 
yet I still have to do it. It's too late for you, dear host. But I think you'll be the lucky one. The luckiest of them all. I want it to be my final time doing this. I want to wither away, to die. I want to be destroyed. Obliterated into the infinite pitch black, empty and cold void. I will let you live after taking over you. Those before you never had this chance. Simply because the process corrupted their mind and soul in a way that never allowed them to live anymore. You will see ugly and evil things. You will experience pain and fear you have never experienced before. Call this letter a curse for those who find it. But you, you will live. You will live because I will die. Before this process is complete and insanity will take over you, I will be dead. This has been going on before I can remember. Since your kind started walking the earth. I don't exactly know its final purpose. Nor did I even bother to understand it. Simply my kind has to do it to your kind. It's always been this way and always will be. I know you are afraid. I know your hands are shaking while you read this. You know this is not a game. And you know there is no escape from this. All you have to do is bite your finger and pour a few drops of blood on the page. Let me show you something new. With sadness. An old demon. I felt more and more empowered by the evil things the letter emanated. I knew this was not a joke. I signed the paper with my blood. It caught fire, its pinkish flames slowly engulfing me. I screamed in pain, but not because I was burning. It was a pain coming from the fact that I was being slowly to taken to another plane, bit by bit. I faded to black in a way. I was still aware, though, and when I opened my eyes, I bit a large glass tube that was all I saw. The tube seemed infinite, and the black smoke that filled it was not damaging me physically. But when that cleared, I saw twisted faces of evil beings. Their shiny teeth, bleeding acid, spit on the glass tube. They were everywhere. Their sharp claws were scratching at the surface, trying to break in and feed. I could see the hunger in their eyes, hatred, fueling whatever they held inside their minds and bodies. The deformities howled and screeched a ravenous desire to eat me. That was my last memory, of being inside the tube. Right after seeing those horrifying creatures, I passed out completely. I don't know how much time I spent inside that tube. Time seemingly wasn't a thing inside it. It was just endless, infinite, darkness all around me. Coming back to my senses, I found myself in a small room. Although it was dimly lit by a flickering yellow light bulb, it was very dark. Right in front of me, there was a chair. It was wrapped in the same exact red velvet that the envelope was made of. Please, sit down, the baritonal voice said, making the room 
tremble as if the eons that passed suddenly had a voice. A voice expressing all kinds of existential terrors and horrors that its owner had witnessed with the passing of this strange man-invented construct. Time. I felt fear licking my brain, and its awful embrace kept me in place, rendering me unable to move. The fear that built up inside me was life-threatening. I knew that in the medical sense of things, a person could be scared to death. My opinion was that it wouldn't take me long to get there. Whatever's in that room with me, whatever presence loomed in the thick, damp, and heavy air, made me fear for my life. The room started shaking, and I sat down on the chair. The voice told me to close my eyes. Red flashes started running before them, even though everyone can only see darkness when they close their eyes. I heard a door opening, then closing shut. There wasn't any door when I first came here, yet again I was absolutely positive that the natural laws, the ones we guided our lives after, did not work here. More so, this wasn't anything natural. Open your eyes, the same voice once again told me. A wave of shock and horror pierced through my heart. It split my soul into halves, never to be repaired again. My mind shattered into thousands of small shards. I was no longer me. Fear took its throne inside my body. The war raged on between what I thought before and what stood before me now. A fiend-like shadow, its eyes burning a bright red hue, fixated me. It was impossible to look at, yet here I was. The monstrosity stood before me, as if it knew me from childhood hours, even from before I was born. The smoky shadow let out a sigh, then a sad smile revealed its shiny teeth. The way its, or maybe I should say his, face contorted into something that revealed a dark, endless, and timeless sadness hit me so hard. The first thing that came to my mind, the way I could picture the sadness that I was seeing, was a barren wasteland with dark clouds in the sky. Just that. Endless clouds being carried away by a worn-out, weary wind above the wasteland of the fiend's former self. Don't be scared, child. I will not hurt you. I hope, the demon fiend said. I stood aghast, static, buzzing through my skull. I always wanted to experience things like this, but not in a way where fear would invade my whole body, like a leech from hell. You will be the last one for me, the last human I will possess. Before I end myself, I can't take it anymore. I chose you because you always wanted to see something that pertains to the supernatural, the demon said, his baritone voice sounding like a thousand metallic hums and clicks overlapping each other. I just want to talk to you a little bit before we do this. I nodded, shivers ran down my spine, and everything I knew before was obliterated by this new experience. This place, this place is called the Hollow, is an antechamber to hell. You heard that door opening and closing, yes? What lies on the other side will make you lose your mind. And it's not even hell itself behind it. He sighed, a deep, dark sadness escaping his mouth. I nodded, the fear that was reigning supreme inside me didn't let me speak yet. 
the hollow was a place where all soon-to-be-possessed people go. There, they could sit face-to-face with the demon that would take over their body. Some of them would tell secrets and forbidden knowledge. Others would say nothing at all. They could show you other worlds, or they could mock, hurt, and eventually possess you like you were nothing. I think the common thing for all people who have been inside this room was fear. A deep, unending, seething fear. I need you to help carry me to a place where I will kill myself. There we will find a pool where I will drown. Because I am tired, the demon said. I finally got my voice back. I was fearful, but yet again... This is not how I wanted to find out about the existence of the supernatural. I didn't want my first experience with it to be me being a vessel for a suicidal demon. The hollow started to tremble and the demon told me we need to hurry. The process will be painful and fear would probably leave eternal marks and scars on my mind. Are you ready, child? The demon asked me. I nodded, tears filling my eyes and he crashed into my chest like a rifle had just been emptied into me. The pain was an eternal flame of hate, a superior being that transcended everything I knew before. The fiend spread itself across my whole body and took over me. Soon he dictated all my actions and movements. My train of thought wasn't my own anymore. I became a prisoner. The purple door appeared in front of me, I let out a scream inside my own mind, only for it to be swallowed whole by the demon's voice. I will shield you from the insanity. You will be alright. Let's go to the pool, he finally said. The door opened and a long black corridor was revealed. It was similar in a way to the tube in which my travel here was done. Men and women were plastered all over its walls. The demon told me that his higher-ups sometimes got off on gluing sinners to the walls, especially murderers, rapists, and pedophiles. Their never-ending screams would echo into the eternity to which they had been condemned. Cries for help and screams of anguish filled the corridor. The absence of light was not a problem for me. I could see through the demon's eyes all the way to the end of this black, horizontal place fit only for beasts and former human psychopaths. What made this new sight special was that it looked like I had a fire in my eyes. I don't know how to explain it better than that. Like when you look through fire and see on the other side, that's exactly what this was. We need to hurry. He knows something's happening. The demon screamed inside my brain. Who knows? I asked, fear breaking my mind's voice. You know who. I started running, although I was not in control anymore. I ran and ran and ran. It felt like an eternity. We reached another door. It was ancient, and the wood was cracked. A howl, followed by a deep groan, echoed throughout the corridor behind me, silencing every scream that came from those sinners trapped in the walls. I heard the behemoth rampaging towards me, And not even for a second did I dare to turn my head around to see who or what it was. I didn't because deep down inside I knew who he was. I opened the door and a bright white light hit me in the face. I was temporarily blinded by this powerful beam but soon came back to it. Run! The demon cried. A circular construction made of stone was taking shape as I was approaching it. Water filled it colored black. It moved unnatural as all things were here. Droplets of dark water rose in the air, dancing under the silvery sky above me. A dark red sun, split into four, was bleeding its core in the air, regenerating itself infinitely. Skeletal birds were flying in the sky, their screams of hateful spite making my soul shake. Trees made out of teeth were chattering when touched by the infernal winds of this place. This is a demon graveyard. The ones who die are buried here. 
that water over there is sometimes used for healing, other times for inflicting pain upon those who did not follow orders. White is for healing. Black is for pain. He told me to part my skin because the dark water needed blood. The crimson liquid was caught almost like it was eaten by the floating dark water droplets. Then they collapsed into the pool, hitting it like a giant rock was dropped from the hell's heavens. A sort of maelstrom was formed, and I looked inside it but saw no end. It was like a bottomless pit. I saw only dead bodies, grotesque skeletons, and horns filling the void, floating around in the endless space, like discarded carcasses of evil. We need to jump. You'll be back to your world safe. I want this to be my grave. My eternal home, he sighed right before I left. I felt him leave my body almost like something from the void pulled him out from me. He was floating, still alive. Thank you for your help, he said, his final words carrying feelings of relief and regret two long arms extended from the blackness and kept him in place. They ripped him into two, an explosion of bright light filling the void for a second. It blinded me and I fainted. I woke up on the back steps of my house. A ringing sound filled my head and I could still hear the screams of those plastered people from the dark corridor. The mark on my hand was still there. The bloodied scratch still showed. I think about it even to this day. What I experienced was borderline insane, but it was only a small part of things we don't know. I got my wish fulfilled by fulfilling a demon's wish. The things I saw will haunt me forever. The subsequent fear emerging from those events is eternally embedded in me, like a tattoo made of darkness. I wonder, what else is out there that we can't see? Ever since I was a little kid, I've been seeing the man down the hall. I don't really know how to describe him, since he only appears when it's really dark, and he's always bathed in shadow. It doesn't matter where I live. We moved twice when I was younger, and didn't change the fact that he showed up every night when I was heading to bed. My parents told me stories that I don't even remember, telling me that I never wanted to go to bed at night. They said I would get upset and cry, saying the man was going to get them. But they always just thought it was an excuse to stay up late. The first memory I have of seeing him was when I was about five years old. I had just left the bathroom from brushing my teeth when I looked up and saw him just standing there, staring at me from down the hall. Not moving, not doing much of anything. Just watching. I remember getting into bed and thinking, whoever that was, they were going to kill my parents. I wondered why they hadn't noticed him. Why they weren't screaming and telling him to get out. Mom, is the bad man gone? I yelled to my parents after a few minutes. Eventually, my mom came in and told me everything was okay. She said I'd just been imagining things. I had a bad dream, that's what they always told me. But I wasn't even asleep yet, so how could it be a dream? It got worse and worse. I started seeing the shadow man in the hallway every single night and realized he'd been there all along. And some nights I just hadn't noticed him. He blended in so well with the darkness. It was like he was made of the night. Soon I started to notice that he was getting closer. He was no longer in the living room where my parents were. He was just inside the threshold of the doorway leading into the hallway. 
It started to happen every night when I left the bathroom from brushing my teeth. I would open the door and look down the hall and he would be standing there, a little closer every time. Why was this happening to me? I'd wonder to myself, ducking into my bedroom and hiding beneath the covers. I'd have trouble sleeping, picturing that hideous shadowy figure inching closer closer all the time. When I moved out from my parents' house and went to college, the shadow man actually went away for a little while. Or at least I tried not to notice him. I tried not to think about him. I brushed my teeth in my bedroom and would pee in plastic bottles, doing anything I could to avoid that dreaded look down the hallway before bed. That was when I always saw him. That was where I always saw him. So I thought maybe I could get rid of him if I just avoided looking. It seemed to work for a while. Ignorance is bliss, after all. I went through college and graduated with honors, finally able to focus on my studies. I got married and had kids. We got a dog and moved into a house in the suburbs. And I forgot all about the shadow man in the hallway. If I did think about him, I dismissed it completely as a childhood nightmare, a bad waking dream. But something happened tonight. I did something which I haven't done in a long, long time. I left my bedroom during the night to go use the toilet. The ensuite bathroom we have next to our master bedroom was having plumbing issues. I'd have to use the one down the hall, I realized. I broke out into a cold sweat for reasons I couldn't understand. Why was I so scared to walk down the hall? Still, I did it, entering the bathroom and turning on the light, scared for a second of what might be lurking in the darkness, waiting for me there. But there was nothing. I did my business and washed my hands and then exited the bathroom and looked down the hall, taking a step and then freezing mid-stride before I moved another inch. He was there. The man in the hallway. The shadow man from my nightmares. He'd always been so far away, impossible to make out the details of him, but now he was so close just inches away from me, moving almost imperceptibly closer by the second. I could finally make up the details of his horrifying face, the decaying gray skin shriveled and torn, riddled with sores and weeping wounds. Fat black worms crawled out from holes in his flesh. I slammed the door of the bathroom shut, hiding inside. Breathing heavily, I locked the door and sat down with my back pressed against it. I was just waiting for him to try to force his way in. But he didn't. Instead, he's just waiting outside for me. Getting closer. Always inching closer. And I don't know what's going to happen when he finally reaches me. I have a pretty good guess. I'm hiding in the bathroom now. Typing this up, there's nothing else to do but sit here and wait for the sun to rise. I'm not going back out there again until then. Except, my wife is calling for me. I can hear her opening the bedroom door. Honey? Why are you just standing at the end of the hall like that? She's saying to the shadow man outside. I want to yell, I want to scream to tell her that's not me, but before I can, she's already speaking again. Come to bed, I hear her say, and the sounds of floorboards creaking can be heard moving up the hallway, away from me. 
and the bedroom door closes slowly. He's not in the hallway anymore, I realize with horror. Now he's in the bedroom with my wife. My partner Steve and I started a YouTube channel all about cave diving a few years ago. It became pretty big due to some of our more dangerous and creative videos, but our subscriber numbers were peaking. Our view count had plateaued and was even beginning to dip into quadruple digits on some of our content. We were trying to think of something really new and different for video. Something that would go viral to put us back on top. That's when Steve suggested something. He said he could find an underwater cave for us to explore that no one had ever been inside of. We could document our journey into the cave and that would definitely get us a bunch of views and new subscribers. Using Google Earth, Steve found a blue spot on the map which he said was definitely an underwater cave. Using Google Earth, Steve found a blue spot on the map which he said was definitely an underwater cave. There is a way to tell by looking for a specific pattern in the sand when viewed from overhead. Our channel was already pretty successful, so the travel expenses were no issue. We live streamed the entire journey for our viewers, getting some buzz going for when we actually explore the new cave. We had already started promoting the video, telling people what we were going to do even though we hadn't officially been to the cave yet, and I didn't even know for sure if it existed. We were still basing everything on Steve's topographical skills, something which I was beginning to grow increasingly uneasy about. Are you sure about this? I asked when we were on the boat heading out towards the site. This is a hell of a lot of overhead for a little blue spot on a map. Trust me, Steve said. I know what I'm doing. This is going to be incredible. A virgin cave for us to explore? Hell, we could even name it after ourselves. I nodded, feeling no better. Something in my gut was telling me this plan was trouble. Somebody was going to get hurt. But it turned out much worse than that. When we finally arrived at the place, there was no longer any doubt what we were looking at. Peering down into the crystal blue water, it was obvious. Man, I don't know how you did it, but I like it. I yelled, giving Steve a high five. My thoughts of danger and my worry for our lives had vanished at the sight of the place, and I had remembered the exhilaration of cave dives, which we had done in the past. We both laughed and toasted each other with a bottle of 7-Up we brought along for the occasion. Neither of us were drinkers, but it was nice to have something cold, bubbly, and sweet, right before we started putting on our gear and getting our cameras ready. There was only so much light in the day, so we didn't waste any more time than we had to and we were in the water shortly after arriving on site. The B-roll footage would be filmed afterwards. The two of us were way too excited to see what was lying down below the waves. One, two, three, dive, dive, dive. The two of us dropped backwards over the side of the boat, plunging into the depths of the calm blue ocean. Weights on our belts allowed us to sink down easily to the sea floor. Going back up would be another matter. From this depth, we would have to decompress slowly, rising to the surface gradually to avoid the bends. Like overshaken soda cans, I always imagined, picturing myself opening up a bottle of Pepsi which has been knocked around too much. If you open it slowly, it won't explode all over you. The same was true of the nitrogen bubbles in your bloodstream while diving in depths. Steve unspooled his tether, giving himself some slack and then drove a stake into the ocean floor near the mouth of the cave. He spun it deeper and deeper into the ground to secure it, like an underground peg which will hold the leash of a rowdy dog. We didn't want it to come loose. If it did, we would both be in a lot of trouble. He pulled on it to test its strength, then gave me the thumbs up signal and began to swim forward into the darker blue water of the cave leading straight down. 
The string on his tether unwound slowly from a spool he was carrying like a giant fishing reel. As I looked down at it unwinding, I felt that strange, sinking feeling in my gut again, like plunging down the big first drop of a roller coaster. We began swimming deeper and deeper into the underwater sinkhole, an abscess in the ocean's smooth, sandy skin, a pocket created by an infection or a tumor which meant to be excised. I shook my head wondering where these strange, horrible thoughts were coming from, so unlike my own. Once we reached the edge of the entrance chamber of the cave, we had a moment to take in our surroundings. The most important thing was to check the current, so I tried to focus on that rather than the paranoid, delusional thoughts floating around my brain. The water was flowing out of the cave, which meant it was safe to go inside. If it was flowing inwards, that would mean a very short video and a very quick exit. But it was clear to go in by the looks of it. At least for now. We would have to continually check the direction of the water flow, and we would need to leave immediately if the direction of the current changed. We gave each other the thumbs up sign and swam forward, heading into the mouth of the unexplored cave where it was much darker. So far we had been swimming straight down, but now we were going forward into a tunnel which began to gradually slope downwards. It was lined with pockmarked stone walls just wide enough for us to fit comfortably through. If it was any narrower, I would have insisted that we turn back, but it was just big enough for us and our equipment. The light from above was blocked out and we had to turn on our lamps as I continued to record our surroundings, and Steve swam ahead, letting out a line from his giant spool of string. The thin cord unwound silently, and I was reminded again of how precarious our lifeline was. How easily it could be severed, leaving us stranded down here in darkness. There were gaps dotting the craggy rocks. Black, empty spaces for creatures to hide inside. I tried not to imagine an electric eel or a shark emerging from those side tunnels, and found myself picturing even more horrifying things instead. For some reason I kept sensing movement from inside the holes which lined the edges of the cave as we swam deeper. There were things living inside the nooks and crannies of this underwater cavern, and they were beginning to notice our presence. The faces of eels and fish which dwelt in the darkness peered out at us with jealous eyes. The movement picked up, and I saw more and more flashes of what looked like fingers poking out from the crags in the rock but I imagine they were the typical flana and fora of the underwater reef hidden by shadow, which simply gave them a more otherworldly appearance. Then I saw it. A hand reached out from one of the holes, groping and feeling in the air, seeming to sense us as we swam past. It was pale and looked impossible in this place far down beneath the waves. Steve was too far ahead to notice it, but I actually screamed, dropping the regulator from my mouth and sucking in salt water. The hand turned as if it had eyes to see me and ears to hear my screams. Desperately, I struggled to get the mouthpiece back in, finally managing to do so with a panicky few moments of forgetting how to breathe. It's not as easy underwater as above, let me tell you, especially when you start seeing things like that. I dropped my gaze for a second when I looked back up towards the hand I saw. It was just a pale, flesh-toned starfish. But I had been so sure a moment before that it was a hand. I hurried to swim and catch up with Steve. He was far up ahead now, and I saw the cave was getting more and more narrow, almost too tight for us to traverse. Steve seemed not to notice this as he swam casually deeper and deeper into the blackness ahead as it got narrower and narrower. Kicking hard with my flippers, I went as fast as I could, kicking up too much sand and dirt in the water but not caring. At this point I was too desperate to notice the mountain of rock sitting atop us was weighing on me, and I needed to get out. My partner was finally getting close up ahead, and I realized he was slowing down to begin another spool of rope. The first tether was getting to the end of its length, and he was about to attach a second lead to it so that we could go into the cave even deeper. He paused and began to work on a new stake, twisting a short length of steel into the sand by our feet. 
I tapped his shoulder and tried my best to get the point across that I wanted to leave. Now. Desperately, I began to point towards the exit, making a symbol for choking that I associated with panic and fear. Steve looked at me like I was insane. He pointed at the camera in my hands, and the implied message was obvious. What about the viewers? Do you think they'll have any interest in what we've recorded so far? The simple answer was no. Despite my fear and the hallucination I had obviously experienced, there was nothing down here. Nothing of any interest, at least. This place was just another cave. The only interesting part about it was that it was unexplored and thus dangerous. We needed to go deeper. To push ourselves to our limits. That was always Steve's way of thinking. I pointed at the second spool of tethering rope, making a hand gesture to indicate we would go to the end of that spool and no further. He nodded and attached the line to the stake and continued moving onward. Taking a deep, shuddering breath, I continued after him, eyeing the pockmarked stone walls nervously. After the next section of the cave, I began to see things that didn't make sense. There were man-made items strewn here and there around the edges of the tunnel. A few cracked pieces of pottery were laying around, almost perfectly preserved in the water away from oxygen and light. This made me take a pause, and I reached down to examine what I had found. That was when I began to notice the change in the current, but by that point it was already too late. Dust and debris in the water could be seen whizzing past my face at an increasingly fast rate. And not only that, but the dust from the tunnel floor was blowing around, making it difficult to see. I flashed my light rapidly on and off, hoping that would catch my partner's attention. Steve noticed and began to turn around. His eyes widened at the sight of the tunnel behind him, as the dust was now creating a hazy fog which made it difficult to see. He started swimming back towards me when several hands appeared from the dark holes in the cave walls. Then dozens of hands reached out like prisoners from behind jail cell bars, their arms not long enough to grab hold of him in some places, but others managed to snare him and wrap him up tightly, snatching at him and pulling him towards the wall of the cave until he was pressed up against it, like a muscle attached to the hull of a ship. And then more hands appeared and began to pull him deeper and deeper into the cave, a conveyor belt made of disembodied limbs. A second later he was gone, vanished into the cloudy, dim water. His flashlight lay pointing up towards the ceiling on the floor of the cave, and I saw more hands reaching out from the ceiling, groping the air and inching towards me. I darted my eyes around and saw the hands were everywhere reaching out and attempting to pull me in like they had with Steve. I was about to go after him when the stake suddenly snapped as if under tremendous force, pulling our lifeline from its anchor and sending the rope flying off into the cave at a thousand feet per second. Both steel anchors whizzed past my face in quick succession, barely missing me. In an instant, the entire rope was gone, and I was left alone in the increasingly cloudy cave hands reaching out to grab at me from all angles. Not sure what else to do and completely terrified. I took a deep, shuddering breath and started swimming out of that place. My mind felt like it was about to snap like a dry twig, my sanity collapsing due to the circumstances. But I tried to ignore those feelings. I stuck at the middle of the tunnel, keeping a safe distance from the reaching hands, looking desperate as they clawed at me. My friend was dead, or worse, but I didn't have time to think about that now. The current was getting stronger, making every inch of battle pressing forward, and I knew it would only get worse as time went on. Kicking my legs with every ounce of strength I had, I pressed forward, the tunnel's visibility down to almost zero in some places. I had to go based on memory and feel, which was the worst part since every time I set my hand on the stone wall I imagined a hand reaching out to grab me, clutching my wrist in its icy grip and pulling me deeper into the darkness. Luckily the hand seemed to have retreated for a little while, as if satisfied by our first offering. But soon they would be done with the appetizer and would want a main course. I came to a split in the cave, which I didn't remember seeing on the way in. 
This gave me pause since I had no idea which way to go. That was the whole reason why we brought the tether to show us the way out. A hundred different scenarios came to mind, including stories I'd heard of people trapped in caves just like this one, wandering a maze of unending turns with no way out as they slowly ran out of air. I checked my tank and saw I had some time left. But if I took the wrong tunnel and got lost, that reserve would be gone very quickly. Examining the two options for a while, I thought I caught sight of the faintest glow of light reflecting off the wall of one of the tunnels. That had to be it, I thought, and swam forward. This tunnel didn't look familiar, I realized, but then none of them did. It was the first time I'd been to this place, and I was starting to realize how dangerous that made my situation. I swam further along, seeing that the tunnel narrowed considerably up ahead. No. This wasn't right. It wasn't this tight getting in, was it? Hands began to reach and crawl from the pockets, like pus escaping from infected sores, moving and crawling along the stone walls. The hands were stark, bone white, and I realized they could be mistaken from a distance as shimmering reflection of light. Damn it, they tricked me, I thought. This place is trying to keep me down here, to lure me in deeper. I spun around and left the probing, desperate hands behind, heading back towards the turn I had taken wrong. When I reached it this time, I didn't hesitate going down the other tunnel quickly, checking my air levels on the way. The detour had taken up too much of my precious air, and I realized I was using it too quickly, breathing heavily like I was. I tried to slow down my respirations and tried to focus on it as a way of distracting myself from the otherworldly arms and hands, which were now clawing desperately at me, hooking their fingers into my suit as I wrenched myself away. And then the worst possible thing happened. Just as I thought I saw a glimpse of actual light from up ahead, one of the hands reached out and grabbed the hose from my regulator. It fell from my mouth as if I was taking in air and then I was left with a mouthful of water instead. For a few moments I tried to fight with the thing grabbing my equipment but then saw there were more of them now too. At least three sets of hands had reached out from one large dark pocket in the stone and now held my air tanks and equipment firmly in their grasp. Twisting from the backpack attached to the air tank, I managed to pry myself free, then began to swim through the cave in a mad dash. My life was flashing in front of my eyes as the light up ahead grew brighter. I knew I could hold my breath for a few minutes, but these were not optimum conditions by any means. Already I could feel my lungs screaming for air. Luckily I had chosen the right tunnel this time and came out into this blue shaft of ocean water which led upwards from the cave. The hands were gone now, and I would have been relieved if not for the fact that they had my equipment. And I now had a long ascent ahead of me. And I would not be allowed to rush it. I had to take my time or I would die from the bends, instead of lack of oxygen. Swimming upwards in intervals, I paused for as long as I thought I could every ten meters or so. I just hoped it would be for long enough. But as my head began to feel light and my vision started to turn black, I knew I couldn't wait any longer. I made a mad dash for the surface, the white light of the sun blooming tantalizingly closer, but always just a little bit further away than I thought. My lungs were screaming for air as my joints began to ache and then exploded with agony, the nitrogen in my blood forcing its way out any way possible. Pockets of gas bloomed on my skin like painful, swelling pimples about to burst. I felt dizzy and nauseated and desperate for air, thinking I was about to pass out any second, when my head burst to the surface of the waves and I was suddenly in the open air once again, gasping in each breath with desperation. The crew looked at me with initial shock, but then began screaming for assistance and medical to be called in. I must have looked even worse than I felt. All I remember after that is being lifted out of the water and laying panting on the deck of our boat, the production manager asking over and over again, Where's Steve? What happened to Steve? Was he still with you when you started coming back up? He wanted a rescue team to go down looking for him. He wanted me to show them where I'd seen him last. I've got it all on videotape, I told him. They can look at that for reference. But tell them I'm not going down there, and they shouldn't either. 
There's a reason why that cave was uncharted. It's cursed. Anyone who goes down there isn't coming back up alive. I'm done with cave diving. For good. I think I'll start a cooking channel instead. Maybe I'll give TikTok a try. Teddy and I had been working at Disneyland for years. The two of us had seen hundreds, if not thousands, of young cast members come and go, heading off to college or to better jobs and brighter futures. Meanwhile, the two of us stuck around. We became a running joke to some of the younger employees, since we were never promoted to management. Most of the lower-level cast members were young, in their early 20s or late teens even, and to them it was just a part-time gig, a way to raise money for college, or to pass a bit of time until their real lives and careers began. But Teddy and I were lifers, some would say losers, Although I would never attach that label to myself willingly, I'd heard it whispered enough times to know that that was what other people thought of us. We'd both been there for nearly two decades. We'd worked on pretty much every single attraction, but had never been deemed responsible enough to be promoted to supervisor status. Over all that time, I found out a lot of secrets about the place. Some things that are known to the public, but... Also, some revelations that aren't talked about anywhere. Did you know that cast members who work as mascots have to wear communal underwear? Yeah, that's right. They all share the same underoos, and they get washed in between uses. At least in theory. Who knows what pervert came up with that idea. Or how about the fact that the skeletons on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride were originally constructed of real bones? Despite the park's insistence that all the bones were removed, a few still remain. Management lost track of which were real and which were fake, so they just left the real ones in there along with the imposters. When you're right up close, it's easy to tell them apart. The real ones are a little more yellow. They're heavier than the plaster ones. There are plenty of morbid secrets like that. People scatter the ashes of their deceased loved ones in the park so frequently, we actually have a not-so-subtle codename for it. White Powder Alert. The Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean are the most common places, but it's done all over. And who knows how often people get away with it without us noticing. Code 101 means the ride is temporarily shut down. Well, Code V, or Protein Spill... Means that someone has vomited on a ride and needs to be cleaned up. Those spills are often the cause of ride shutdowns rather than mechanical issues. Oh, and if you hear yourself or someone else being referred to as a treasured guest, it doesn't mean you're a VIP. It's actually our code word for saying you're being an asshole. There are stories of ghosts, some told by people who never believed in such things before witnessing them in the park. The specter of Walt Disney himself has been seen at times, outside Sleeping Beauty's castle, just on the other side of the drawbridge. Or sometimes he's seen at night, just outside his old apartment on Main Street, where occasionally you might smell a whiff of cigarette smoke, despite the fact that such things are banned inside the park. Walt Disney and his family once lived there so they could spy on visitors and listen to their opinions about the park. They would eavesdrop on their conversations from their second floor apartment, just above street level. George, a dead electrician, supposedly haunts the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And every morning, cast members have to call out, Good morning, George, at the start of the day. Otherwise, the ride will mysteriously have issues all day long. Unexpected shutdowns and other strange occurrences are commonplace if George isn't given his proper morning greeting. And have you heard about how the animatronics in It's a Small World run all night long? 
Yeah, those rumors are true too. In fact, quite a few of the lifelike robotics stay in motion 24-7. Even throughout the lockdowns and park shutdowns a couple years back. If you ask management about this, they'll tell you it's because the attractions are cheaper to maintain this way. They break down less frequently if they're in constant motion. And that's the excuse we get anyways. But I've come to realize there may be a far more terrifying reason for this. Something so disturbing and twisted I wouldn't have thought it possible if I hadn't witnessed it for myself. Teddy and I were on our lunch break when we found the storage room. We were looking for somewhere private, since Teddy had brought a bit of homegrown greenery in his favorite piece of glassware that day. The park has miles and miles of tunnels crisscrossing underneath it, and Teddy and I had explored most of this labyrinth over our years of service. Like everything in the park, there was a stupid nickname for these underground tunnels. They'd been dubbed Utilidors by some management type in the distant past. Most of the cast members just called them the tunnels, and they were so vast that we often used golf carts to get from one end to the other. There were odd dead ends, and some tunnels seemed to intentionally lead to nowhere. We were currently in one such useless utilidor when we noticed an odd-looking door, which appeared to be at least a half-century old, if not more. It had a rusted placard hanging on its surface which read, Obsolete Animatronics Storage. Hey, didn't there used to be a vending machine here? Teddy asked. Cares. Let's see if it opens. I only got 20 minutes left, I said, looking at the time on my cell phone. The doorknob turned in my hand, and the two of us went inside. I looked for a light switch on the wall to my right, but didn't find one. It's pitch black and impossible to see anything inside the room. Using the flashlight on my cell, I cast a beam of light, trying to see what kind of space we were in. There were people-shaped forms all around us, draped in tarps and tablecloths. The room was as long as a football field, but it was narrow, only about 15 feet across. Creepy, Teddy said, taking the words right out of my mouth. Well, I guess it did say this was animatronic storage. This must be really old. He wandered away from the door, and it clicked shut behind him. Something about that made me nervous but I ignored the feeling. The door had been unlocked, and that meant we'd be able to get out again. Still, I reached for the doorknob to check it. My hand was about to touch the polished brass when Teddy called out, making me jump. Whoa, check this out! He said, sounding excited. I left the door, turning around to see what he was looking at. He had his cell phone flashlight on now as well, and was lifting up one of the tarps to see what was underneath. Yo, man, this thing is freaky looking. He pulled the tarp all the way off, and I saw what he meant. The thing hidden underneath was very creepy. It had the goateed face of a young man, but the ears and nubby horns of a goat, looking far too real. Its lower half looked like it also belonged to a goat. The thing reminded me of a satyr, those... Drunken, lustful, half-goat gods from Greek mythology. I tried to figure out why it was making me feel so uneasy, and I realized it was the eyes. They were far too lifelike. They're far more real than the animatronics had in the park. And look at the skin, the way it reflected the light, everything about it. Looked, it looked like this was a real creature. Or more likely a man who had been sewn to the body of a goat in a very thorough way, making the seams blend together perfectly. Teddy was already moving on to the next one, looking under another tarp. He left me alone with this one, and I looked back down as I let go of the cover and let it fall over its face again. Flinching backwards, I nearly screamed, as I could have sworn the eyes of the thing were looking up at me, just as I dropped the tarp over its face again. My heart was beating fast now, and I tried to tell myself it was just a trick of the light. Or that the eyes had been looking up that way the whole time, and I just hadn't noticed. 
We need to go. I heard myself say, but Teddy wasn't listening. Holy shit, this one's even more jacked up. Dude, you gotta check this out. I opened my mouth to say no, let's get out of here, but the words caught my throat. The thing under the tarp was clearly moving now. Its head was still draped in the plastic sheet, but I could see it turning to look up at me, as if its gaze could penetrate right through the tarp. Yo, dude, come check this out, Teddy was saying, pulling the next sheet off and dropping it to the floor. I saw what he was referring to, my eyes drawn to it, despite my terror of the draped creature just in front of me. This one was tall. Standing nearly ten feet, it had one large eye instead of two. Man, whoever made these things was tripping on acid or something. Look at this! Looks like they jacked an eyeball from an elephant and stuffed it in this dude's forehead. I think they were trying to make a cyclops. I could barely hear him, as now the thing in front of me wasn't the only figure in the room which was moving. To my left, the entire row of covered forms were beginning to stretch and turn, as if waking up from a very long nap. Some were tall and some were short, like the satyr thing on my right, but all of them were alive. I realized it was very cold all of a sudden, and breathed out to see my breath steaming in the air. A compressor had grown to life, and I saw a nearby vent cough out a frosty plume, as if something had been jammed or broken and was suddenly operating again. The temperature in the room began to plummet, and a second later I was freezing cold, the rushing air chilling the back of my neck. Finally, I was shocked out of my stupor and managed to get out a word. Teddy, I croaked, but too late. The cyclops hand shot out and grabbed my friend by the throat. It lifted him up into the air while his legs kicked and his arms thrashed, trying to break its grip. He was choking and sputtering, flailing madly as he tried to free himself. The cyclops held firmly onto his throat and I heard the sounds of cartilage and bones being crushed. His spine popped and his head bent back at an impossible angle, his skull lolling backwards like a broken Pez dispenser. And then the giant dropped him to the concrete floor of the room, and his phone clattered and turned over, casting half the room in darkness again. I backed away, feeling like I was moving in slow motion, but unable to go any quicker. Reaching back for the doorknob, I felt like the tunnel had grown by a hundred feet. It was further away than could be possible. I kept backing up, taking slow, quiet steps. The figures were moving toward me now, all of them were closing the gap, slowly walking in my direction. Their forms were covered, draped in bedsheets, tarps, and tablecloths, as if, as if this place had been thrown together in a hurry, hastily constructed to house these possessed animatronics or whatever these creatures were. Cold air was filling the room, making it even more difficult to move. My skin felt like it was being stabbed with pins and needles, the freezing wind going right through my summer clothing. There was a sound of tearing flesh and blood being spilled, and I looked to see several of the monsters were tearing the skin from Teddy's face, peeling it from the bones with some difficulty, like trying to open an underripe orange. The worst part was, it looked like he was still alive. He was opening his mouth, closing it like a fish out of water, his eyes wide open, as if he would be screaming if he were capable of it. I tried to tear my eyes away from this, but could not, and found myself staring at him as they took the flesh from his face. I backed up hard into something and realized it was the door. In the darkness, I felt for the doorknob behind me, but couldn't find it. The creatures were still moving toward me, all of their faces covered by the sheets except for the massive cyclops which had killed my friend. Its one huge eyeball was fixed on me and it moved in lockstep with the other creatures, as if they all shared one hive mind. As they approached, a few stepped on each other's coverings, tearing them away and revealing their hideous faces. I saw a woman's upper body sewn onto the legs of a deer, and a man with the hindquarters of a bull, their faces full of mute anger. My hand groped for the doorknob desperately, and after several long moments, it settled on the smooth brass. It was so cold, almost frozen. I spun around, expecting the doorknob to turn easily again, but this time it was stuck. I couldn't tell if it was locked or frozen solid, but either way, it wouldn't budge. Feeling like there would be icy hands around my throat at any second, I was too terrified to turn around. I heard the sounds of shuffling feet moving closer, the icy wind blowing through my clothes and raising goosebumps on my skin. I began to pound on the door with my fists, banging on it as hard as I could and screaming for help, pleading for someone to save me. Help! Open the door! 
I yelled at the top of my lungs. The corridor we had entered from was a dead end, really used by anyone. Of course, this door would be locked from the inside. I thought to myself, who would offer an escape to these animatronic demons? If they had ever been imbued with any sort of failsafe, it was long out of commission and useless. These creatures had no mercy, no respect for human life. They just wanted blood and fresh faces to create more of themselves to raise an army of undead robotic creatures. Manic thoughts were racing through my head as I tried to think of another way out. There had to be something, some other way. I turned around hoping for some other exit to present itself, but instead I just saw hundreds of shrouded forms stepping closer until they were just a few feet away. A gurgling, wheezing sound could be heard from behind them, and I realized it was the labored breaths of Teddy slowly dying. If I didn't find a way out, it would be me next. With one desperate move, I kicked out towards the head of the nearest shrouded figure, Satyr. My foot connected with its face, and as it did, the entire crowd fell a step back, as if hurting one of them would hurt them all. I lashed out with another blow, punching it in the gut, and the crowd took another wounded step backwards. I used this newfound space to take my advantage. I took a running start towards the door. Kicking it hard with my boot, I connected squarely with the spot beside the doorknob, and it rattled in the frame, but didn't budge. Taking a quick look back over my shoulder, I saw the crowd of animatronic creatures were now coming at me again with renewed anger. They looked furious at me for assaulting them, apparently injuring one of them. The satyr was slumped forward, its joints making creaky noises as it made its way towards me, its movements jerky and disorganized. I kicked the door again harder this time, using every ounce of force I could muster. I heard something splinter and break, but still it didn't budge. Icy hands gripped my throat from behind, I threw an elbow backwards to try to break free. It connected with whatever it grabbed hold of me, but it didn't let go. Instead, its grip tightened, choking me and squeezing my throat until I couldn't breathe. I let another strangled cry for help, but no sound came out this time. The grip on my windpipe was making it impossible to call out. My feet were going numb from the cold, which seemed to have intensified even more somehow. I hadn't thought it was possible to feel any colder, but realized whatever was controlling the temperature of this place was doing this on purpose. These things did not like the cold. It put them into a state of hibernation. But for some reason, this place had almost been room temperature when we entered, bringing these creatures back to life. With one more desperate effort, I lifted my leg and kicked as hard as I could, my heel connecting with the door just beside the latch. Something shattered and broke loudly, and the door swung open on its hinges. The momentum brought me forward, and I found myself tumbling back into the corridor. Whatever grabbed hold of me from behind came with me, the icy hands frozen around my neck. As I landed, the thing's fingers broke off like icicles, shattering on impact. The shrouded creature was writhing on the floor, looking as if it wanted to get up to chase me, but wasn't quite capable of it yet. It was still too cold. I stumbled to my feet and ran from there, not really thinking about my mistake until I was too far away from that spot to do anything about it. When, I occurred, when it occurred to me what I had done, it was too late. I had let those things out. I had opened the door, freeing them. And I had allowed the warm air inside so they could come back to life and escape. I was too terrified to stay in the park. I went home immediately without saying a word to anyone and called my boss and told him I was sick with a stomach flu. I apologized, saying I had been throwing up in the bathroom and didn't want to cause a code V while on stage. He told me that was okay, since he knew I was a dedicated employee, a trusted cast member who had been with the park for years. But he did ask if I had seen Teddy. I had to lie to him and tell him no. I'm supposed to go back to work tomorrow for the first time since all this happened. The worst part about it is nobody's reported Teddy missing. His family hasn't called to say anything either. It's it's almost like none of this ever happened. Except I've got the marks around my neck to prove it. The bruises that prove I didn't imagine it. I just got a strange text message from Teddy's cell phone number. See you at work tomorrow, buddy, it said, accompanied by a mouse emoji. Me and some other cast members have a big surprise for you. <laughs>